All right, I think we're now live, Carlton. I want to wish everybody a, a hello on this Thursday evening. This is in our series of conversations with Commodores, and the fella on the other side here out in Oregon really needs no introduction. You guys know him, Carlton Hall, who was a, a monster for the Commodores in the mid mid 90s and i appreciate you taking a few minutes and talking with us this evening carlton i hope you're doing well out there doing well bernard thank you for uh <clears throat> you know one for having you know a medium age guy on i appreciate it you know we're not we're not old yet so we're medium and uh two like i like i told you in private man this is uh, a, a great thing you're doing man I, I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart and i know a, a lot of of the guys that I've talked to, um, I really, really appreciate what, you know, the effort that you put forth, man. So we, we appreciate that 100%. Absolutely. It's, I tell you, it's a labor of love. Ask me to do it again. I'll do it again. But uh, we got a whole bunch of guys rolling through here. I'm going to tell you who's here, some of which are your teammates from past years, some of which are my teammates. Uh, we got Dwayne Jones, equipment man extraordinaire. Uh, Gerald Jackson, and forgive me, guys, if I've mispronounced some names of some of the guys who I don't know. Uh, Tor, Jim, O.J. Fleming, Carlton Hall, of course, is joined. Uh, Cal Jumper, uh, Ken and Kathy Hammond, John DeWitt. They're just there's a bunch of them rolling. They want to hear from you tonight. Doctor, Doctor, Doctor DeWitt. Now, Doctor. that's right. That's exactly right. Um, well, I you just updated me on what's going on with you from a professional standpoint. So before we dig into the history. Let's start with the present. Tell us about your new job and what's going on there with your new school. <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, with all stuff that's going on, uh, came back out to Oregon, um, where right now, I guess, previously I was the linebacker coach here at Southern Oregon University. So, um, NAI school, uh, I got here in 17 and um, had a great year, went to the semifinals and probably got robbed down in Georgia, as many of a West Coast or Central Plains team could could say. And then, uh, <clears throat> so about a week ago or so, I talked with um, head coach that uh, is at Milliken University, who actually went to Vanderbilt, uh, Dan Gritty, was a student there, uh, student assistant there, um, graduated from Vanderbilt. So he is the head coach at Milliken University in Decatur, Illinois. So. Uh, and talking with him and, and the athletic director there, Milliken, um, Greg White, we uh, <clears throat> agreed on some things. So uh, right now I am uh, headed out to Illinois probably here in the next week or so, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, no spring ball and things like that right now uh, that everyone's dealing with across the country. Um, it's not a rush, but, you know, you still, as with any coach, you know, you want to get there and, um, when you can't meet the kids, you want to get started on at least knowing where you're at and uh, getting acclimated to time zones and, and, and people and things like that. So I, I will be the, the linebacker coach and the defensive coordinator at uh, Milliken University. Congratulations on your yeah, thank you, Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll see how your defense stacks up against yeah. the prior years. Yeah, of Milliken. exactly right. That's exactly right. When, you're, when your name gets put on it, you know, there's – uh, there's a whole, whole different, the whole different uh, animal there. So, uh, right. and I would, I would be remiss too, Bernard, if I didn't talk yeah. about uh, very quickly, just talking about defensive coordinators. Um, obviously, this past week, um, you know, uh, we lost, everyone lost, uh, Woody Woodenhofer, and uh, I'm sure, you know, like anybody, the Woody stories can flow, um, you know, endlessly, um, to the point where uh, the AD at Milliken, uh, Mr. White, actually played for, or actually was a GA for Woody at Missouri back in 85. That's how, that's how small the world is sometimes, you know, and I, and I always tell it to kids that I'm recruiting, the higher you go in athletics, the smaller the world gets, right? Because your community in high school becomes your community in college. And, you know, obviously those communities start to, to meld together. So, um, you know, and doing my research on him and I saw that and I was like, wow, I said, you know, Mr. White, and he said, do you have any questions for me? And I said, yeah, I said, you know, what's your best Woody story? And uh, and he started and he started laughing. He said, did, he said, that's right. He said, you did play for Woody. I said, yes, sir. I said, uh, I saw on your bio that you were at Missouri with him. And he was like, yeah, Woody was something else. And, you know, obviously he's the athletic director of a school that's trying to hire you. So I'm sure the stories will get better once I get on campus. But um, I would be remiss to, if we didn't talk about, um, you know, a guy who, you know, brought <clears throat> and, um 
infinite amount of what the you know kids would now call swag bernard it was one of those things where the people that were the hundred or so people that were in the meeting that first meeting that we had uh, when Donardo had left and Dow Howard comes in and, and that staff and, and after the very first team meeting Bernard um, there, there was probably uh, uh, a line drawn in the sand between offense and defense probably about 34 seconds after that team meeting and we went to the defensive meeting so um, he, he just he knew what he was doing he uh, he was confident beyond belief and you know, obviously, too, you know, the other thing that doesn't always get pointed out with coaches is, you know, the other assistants that are there with them. Um, you know, Norm Parker was our linebacker coach, and I'll start with Coach Parker. I mean, he's the one that actually taught me how to play football. You know, and there's there's absolutely no doubt about that. He, you know, I would put Coach Parker up there with, with any linebacker coach in the entire country, you know, ever. Um, our defensive back coach was Perry Fuel. You know, Perry Fuel's only been – an interim head coach two or three times in the NFL and should have been, been an NFL head coach by now. Um, you know, defensive coordinator, Super Bowls and things of that nature. Um, Ron Aiken was our D-line coach. And, and besides being one of the best human beings on the planet, uh, Coach Aiken, and uh, his, actually he and I, my relationship with Coach Aiken goes back to, gosh, I was, I think, a junior in high school and he was recruiting me to New Mexico State. And, uh, you know, as with any good coach, you know, he's going to find some connections that you have. And Coach Aiken actually went to North Carolina A&T where my dad went to school. And, you know, back in the day when you filled out all those questionnaires, you put where your mom went and your dad went. And so he had an in right away. Um, but he's, you know, been the uh, – he was with um, – uh, oh, my goodness, the head coach of the Cardinals when they went to the Super Bowl, Coach Wisenhunt. So he was the D-line coach of that that staff that Coach Wiz put together in Arizona. I mean, um, they were just, you know, they were just, you know, even Coach Wizenhunt was on that staff, right? When Coach Dahar first got here, Coach Wiz was our, our tight end coach and our special teams coordinator. So, um, you know, Rennie Simmons was the O-line coach who had only, you know, coached in the Super Bowl and, excuse me, won three Super Bowls. Right. Uh, you know, they were <clears throat> just a, a whole bunch of time when that staff came in. But after that first team meeting, uh, Woody made it clear in no uncertain terms that, uh, you know, they were where to, they were here to win football games. So um, if anybody remembers on the defensive side of that meeting that we had, yeah, there were there were a couple of good ones that, you know, kind of made us like, all right, look, this this guy probably knows what he's talking about. We've seen their resumes as, as far as it goes. So um, between those two, between Woody and, and Norm, um, Everything I would teach a linebacker came from those two guys. 100%. I was going to say, you, you learned a heck of a lot with those guys. But two things I wanted to add. One, I don't know if you know Coach Rick Christoffel, who's been in the pros now for many years. But Coach Christoffel was my quarterback's coach when I was there. He had been with Watson Brown, whatever Watson had moved. But Rick has been in the pros. And he was, I think he was with the Cardinals with Wisenhunt. I may be wrong about that, but I think I'm right. Uh, coaching tight ends, and I think he's with the Buccaneers now. Uh, but the second thing I was going to say, Carlton, is if you look at Coach Woody's coaching tree, and I bet as you coach in different parts of the country, that tree must branch tremendously. There's so many coaches who have been developed by him or played for him over the years, and it's a real tribute to his legacy, and I know you're very happy to have been been part of that as uh, Alfonso Harvey and so many others who are watching us right now. And he gives you a big shout out. Uh, so I'm sure those are some great memories you guys had. No, it, it, it was. Bernard. And, and, you know, I tell, you know, now that I am in this business, um, you know, I tell kids all the time, you know, usually if I'm coming in, I'm obviously a new coach with an entire new, entirely new staff. Um, you know, when I got here to Southern Oregon, I was going to be the third linebacker coach in three years here. And, I always make it a point to tell the kids, look, until you've had five position coaches in five years, like I did at Vanderbilt, right. until you had three head coaches, like I did in five years, there's not really too much you can say to me. You know, you, you start with a clean slate or as clean as it's going to be, and you go out there and work your tail off and, and you know, prove whether you're, you know, you can play or not. Or, so it is uh, one thing where – you know, coaching has given me a lot. You know, I thought about it the other day with so much time that we have. We're posting pictures of everything we can find, you can get a hold of at this point, Bernard. So just in thinking about 
you know, all the coaches that I had throughout the years, um, you know, I played even in high school, I played for two guys that are Oklahoma legends um, in Dick Evans and, and um, Dennis Huggins. Those guys were more legends, you know, before, I guess, kind of Jinx and Tulsa Union and <clears throat> the Tulsa schools took over uh, Midwest City, which is, you know, home to Mike Gundy and home to Kale Gundy. And, um, you know, Coach Coach Evans was the first head coach to win two big, you know, or the highest level uh, state championships back then. You know, there was just the history of, of the good coaches that I had where, you know, they have you working out and doing bomber pride and rocket rides and all those other kind of crazy stuff you do during the summertime. So I was, I have been lucky enough, you know, where I've had some really, really good coaches that were good men that, um, you know, took it upon themselves to, to really, you know, take the challenge of being a coach and, and, and molding, if you will, young men sure. to, to being, you know, medium age men and fathers and sons and, and brothers and things like that. So, um, well, you know, Carlton, definitely a shout to all of those guys. Yeah. Sure. Well, clearly coming out of Midwest City, they some coaches must have must have seen you pretty early on. Talk about talk about the recruiting process coming out of Oklahoma. Oklahoma, much like a lot of the states in the South and California, it's just such a hotbed for for high school athletes. And I know that when you were coming up as a sophomore, junior, senior. You wanted to play in in college, and and a lot of colleges started finding you. So talk about how did you get Vanderbilt on your radar, and how is it ultimately that you decided that's where you wanted to sign and, and go to school? Um, you know the the process was you know obviously much different with the internet now. Um, there were still um, you know some guys that were going around the country, uh, Tom Lemming's report and uh, you know Blue Chip, you know those that was the equivalent of these kids stars now, right? So, you know those magazines and and again you know being lucky enough to play at at a at a school that had um, the history that Midwest City had, um, you know just recently having won uh, a couple state championships, like I said with with Mike and, and Kale Gundy and and being really good. Um, you know, not to mention, I had some good players I played with, but, you know, Midwest City was, um, you know, kind of the preeminent high school in the Oklahoma City area for athletics. Um, you know, for crying out loud, I mean, we were national champions in wrestling my sophomore year, like USA Today national champions, you know what I mean? So there was <clears throat> this eye that was on us. And, you know, I tell people all the time, if you go look at the defense um, that I had in high school my senior year, and, and two of the guys on that defense were juniors. One went to Tennessee and one went to Alabama, <laughs> the two juniors did. Um, there were nine of 11 guys that went and played 1A football. Wow. And, you know, this is 1992, you know, so we were really good. We, you know, a couple people got hurt and all those things. So, you know, never played for a state championship, but um, we had some really, really, really talented, you know, players. My tailback, a uh, guy named Terrence Joseph, uh, he ended up going to Tulsa. He and I were together at the San Diego Chargers in 1998, Bernard. I, mean, I got a chance to go through, you know, literally my first NFL training camp with my high school tailback for crying out loud. You know, that, those are the types of things um, are really cool. So, you know, in the recruiting process, um, you know, I didn't. The first time I got a letter from, uh, from Vanderbilt, I had to ask my dad where it was. You know, as I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of people who have gone to Vanderbilt through the years, you know, had that first moment of where, where the heck is this place? You know, so, you know, you, 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 you try to do your research back then. And I knew it was a good school. Obviously, I knew it was in the SEC. Uh, my mom's from Tallahassee and, and, and my dad is from Wilmington, North Carolina. So, you know, I'd grown up in the South most of my life. Um, I think it was, you know, a, a culmination of a whole bunch of things. You know, my dad was in the Air Force. Um, he was stationed at Tinker Air Force Base. And uh, midway through my junior year, he got another assignment to go to Dayton, Ohio, at Wright, to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So, you know, Oklahoma was recruiting me. I had taken, you know, obviously, um, not obviously for you, but obviously for any ride from Oklahoma. I could ride from, I lived on the southeast side of the city. I could take Sooner Road all the way into Norman. I didn't have to get on the highway. Sure. And with, sure. with Kale being the quarterback there, um, you know, my quarterback and I, Kamasi Ford, one of my best friends to this day, uh, we would get in either the Cutlass or the Rabbit and, and pray to God that both the <laughs> engines held up so we could ride down to Norman, you know, and go hang out. But, 
Um, Norman, Oklahoma, it was the one time in history where Oklahoma was not great. Not great. And uh, I wasn't going to spend four or five years in Stillwater. Um, I, I knew I didn't want to do that after taking a couple of visits up there. Um, Colorado was, you know, preeminent school when we were coming out. Um, they had just won a national title. So I took a visit to Colorado and um, I loved it. You know, Coach McCartney was a great guy. Um, the guy that was recruiting me, uh, who's since passed away, um, Coach Gregory, great guy. You know, just genuine, you know, without, you know, having to try too hard. You know, I'm around coaches obviously all the time. And you know, there's some coaches that just try too hard, Bernard, to just be friends with the kids and things like that. You know, and there's a there's a fine line you walk in that. But he was uh, – they were just genuine people. So, um, you know, my host uh, – or my, my visit to Colorado was, was – Absolutely insane. It was 25 years ago, but I remember like yesterday because I got a chance to meet Muhammad Ali the first time on my visit to Colorado. Um, I was in the, in the it was in the airport. And this is going to be real funny to a lot of people. I was in the airport doing trigonometry homework, right? Friday of morning. Of course, of course. Uh, I didn't make it through trig much longer, Bernard. By the way, but I was doing trying to do trig homework in the airport, and I see these, you know, two two blip two big African American dudes walking you know, with trench coats on and suit and tie. And then I see a guy kind of shuffling behind him and, you know, kind of, I let it go and look back up and they sat down probably, I don't know, 20 feet from me. And I turn around and look again, it's Muhammad Ali. And, and uh, so needless to say, I, I got up the nerve to pack up my trick homework and uh, walk over to him. And as I walked over to him, you know, two guys kind of stepped in my way and put their hands up. And I probably told uh, the champ, my whole life story in 20 seconds. And, you know, and, and the coolest thing was he went in his jacket pocket and, um, he had a suit on, obviously he pulled in his jacket pocket and he pulled out a baseball card and on the baseball card, it was him. He signed the bottom of it and gave it to me and said, good luck. And, uh, so needless to say, I had also just gotten an earring for the first time. So when I showed up in Bo in Denver, Colorado, my dad was on a different plane. And I'm trying to tell him about meeting Muhammad Ali, and all he can wonder about is this earring I got in my ear, you know. So, yeah. um, but I had a great time. It, it was, you know, they were playing in a Fiesta Bowl. All three of those linebackers that Colorado had it was Chad Brown and Greg Beekert and Teddy Johnson. All three of those guys played in the league for you know ten plus years. Um, but it was just. It was it was different, you know. Colorado, it was it was the epitome of what I had seen at Oklahoma. There was obviously really good athletes there. Um, school was, you know, all right. Obviously, the school depends upon what you make it. Uh, my second visit, I took the Southern Cal, Bernard. I actually went out to Southern Cal, um, you know, Southern Cal for crying out loud. But again, it was you know one of the few times in history where Southern Cal football wasn't great and. They had just fired the head coach. The guy that uh, they brought in was Coach uh, John Thompson. And obviously, you know, he's a, a legend in Southern Cal. He's a legend in football annals, too. And so when you got John, or excuse me, John Robinson, not Thompson, when you got John Robinson sitting in your house trying to give you the NFC championship ring, <laughs> telling you, hey, you know, if you sign this piece of paper, why don't you hold on to the ring at the same time and, you know, I'll yeah. pick both up. You know, those are the, the types of things that, that coaches do that I've done, you know, to to try to get kids enticed to, 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 to choose your school. I took a visit to – my visit to Vanderbilt was a lot different. Um, I actually just recently told this story to uh, Coach Mason um, and uh, uh, Mr. Turner, who is no longer the AD at Vanderbilt. But um, I just I – I was, I was not going to wrestle my senior year. And I knew I was going to Colorado. It, was, it wasn't pretty much, it wasn't really a secret. And uh, Coach McCartney was like, look, why wouldn't I want a linebacker in a linebacker stance after school for two hours every day? All right, Coach, you know, whatever you say. So I ended up being a wrestler, or I had wrestled before, but I ended up wrestling my senior year. And um, there was a match. The weekend I was supposed to go to Vanderbilt, um, we had a match against our rivals. Now, obviously, for most of the viewing public, that's watching this Bernard wrestling around the country is not that big a deal in Oklahoma though. Um, you know, football is still first, but wrestling is a very, very close second. And so when I moved to Oklahoma in eighth grade, I had no idea what wrestling was Bernard. I literally, uh, this is a shout out to, 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 to Dennis Stein, my first wrestling coach, history teacher. 
after football season in eighth grade, he takes me, he has a wrestling room, you know, junior high wrestling room across from his history classroom. And he's like, Carlton, you know, you need to wrestle. I was like, all right, coach. He said, uh, so he takes me in the wrestling room. And so I'm looking around the wrestling room and I said, uh, coach, um, you know, where are the ropes? And he looks at me and he says, well, you know, we have some, we have some jump ropes over in the corner. And I was like, nah, coach, like, where are the ropes? And so he finally understood it. I thought he was talking about WWF, Bernard. Like, I was really ready to, you know, have a signature move and come off the top rope or something like that, man. I, I mean, I was 13 years old. I'd never seen collegiate wrestling in my life. So yeah. he, he was looking at me like, I, I can't believe this kid is, is actually asking me where the ropes are. So um, we were wrestling our rival. And um, the weekend I was supposed to go to Vanderbilt and the rivalry between the two schools, Midwest City and the other school in our district um, was pretty, pretty big. I mean, we were, I think, probably two or three in the state. They were one or two in the state. Uh, We were both ranked in the top 10 in the country and so on and so forth. So there was two reasons. One, you know, it's your rival. You want to beat your rival. Two, the kid that I had to wrestle that night, um, the first time I ever wrestled, Bernard, he pinned me in like 20 seconds. So needless to say, from being a 13-year-old pudgy fat kid to now, you know, being strong and, you know, Mr. Football guy, I was like, well, I got to beat this kid before, you know, there's some, some definite arrogance going on there. It's just you and another guy on the mat, which is why I love wrestling on top of it. So we go out, we win the match. Um, Denard, Coach Donardo, you know, we'd be remiss without giving a shout out to, to Jerry Donardo for recruiting that class because... I don't care what anybody says, Bernard. I, I will. I will argue to the cows come home that the 1993 Vanderbilt football class is probably still the best recruiting class, at least on paper, because you know the rankings were at least there. Those guys did a great job. Jerry DiNardo and that staff, Carl Reese and Ed Lambert, and you know Rick Rick George, who's now the AD at Colorado. Those guys were really good about evaluating talent. And if you look at it, you know some of my best friends in the world, obviously from New Jersey. New Jersey, Delaware, Kentucky, Chicago, Texas. You know, there were some some guys where they went around the entire country to, to find some talented kids. So And that's I don't mean to interrupt you, but that's that has to be with Vanderbilt with each of their recruiting classes, because you've got that dreaded team over in Knoxville, you've got Memphis to the West, and it, it's just from a standpoint I don't think that a lot of the better athletes, A, could qualify to get into Vanderbilt from the metro area. Now, every year they do take some kids from the state of Tennessee, but it's not like a state school where an Alabama or a Georgia is going to scoop up all of that talent. So they've got to go, just like in my recruiting class, there were kids from both, everywhere, from both coasts. But go ahead. You're talking about the 93, your team, your class. And they they have to be, Bernard. You know, you have to, you know, I've heard, Coach Mason, I've heard, uh, I've heard Woody, I've heard Jerry Donardo, I've heard uh, Derek Mason all say this, and 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 Derek said it in a in a different tone, um, but he's right. If you went to Vanderbilt, you understand what he was at least trying to say was, he's not really recruiting against Alabama, Auburn, Tennessee every year. He is really recruiting against Stanford, Northwestern, Rice, Duke, Wake. Um, and to be able to get those kids, because it is a special kid that goes to Vanderbilt. Everybody who's you know sitting here, you know, including you and I, that's sitting listening to our voices right now, you you were a special person uh, to be able to pick Vanderbilt to play there and to go to school there. I mean, it's not easy. Um, there isn't enough talent in the state of Tennessee. I don't care what anybody tells me. There's not enough talent in the state of Tennessee alone to field three one A schools. There's just not. There's just not that much talent. And obviously the talent pool shrinks tremendously, like you said, when you have to worry about academics. And I say have to worry about, I mean, it's not a bad thing, but when you have to adhere to those academic standards. So you do have to search the whole country. You do have to have some people with connections that are just not in the South and just not on the West Coast or what have you. You, you got to go and search these kids out, whether they're in Colorado or Idaho or Montana or uh, Georgia or Florida. You have to be able to seek those kids out. So I was really worried to have to tell Jerry DiNardo I wasn't going to come on my visit, right? So he said, Carlton will take care of him. I said, all right, Coach. So um, I wrestled that night. It's Friday night match. Um, I win the match. I win my match, and we win the duel, right? So 
needs to say I'm fired up. Like this is I beat this kid who beat the pants off me before. Um, you know, we're ranked in the country. We're going to be number one in the state. The whole thing's going. Um, you know, it's one of those triumphant slow clap moments at the end of some movie, high school movie. But it was it was awesome, right? So. Um, before the match, I looked up and Carl Reese, who was our first defensive coordinator at Vanderbilt we had, and uh, Ed Lambert, who uh, I actually talked to um, a few months back, um, they were in the stands. And so I'm like, okay, you know, they came watch me wrestle, right? Cool. So I win the match. Like I said, we win the duel. And um, we go, I go back home to get my bag and head to the airport. So, you know, I'm still riding, obviously, this tremendous hypernome. And it starts to dawn on me that it's about 10 o'clock. And we are going to uh, the uh, airport in Oklahoma City, Will Rogers. And so <laughs> it starts to dawn on me like it's 10 o'clock. So I look at my watch and I didn't say anything. And, and uh, so we start going down. And as, as you're on your way to, to, to the Air Force, to Will Rogers, there's a turnoff like every airport where you can go, just like in Nashville where they have the um, – um uh, the air national guard planes right so instead of going to the terminal we'd make a right and we start going towards the c-130s and again my dad being air force i'm like okay like are we really about to get on the c-130 there's, a, there's no honky tonk express you know from oklahoma city to nashville or something crazy so we uh we pull up to um this uh hangar and um I get my bag out of the trunk and, and coach lambert uh, we're walking around the corner, and Coach Lambert looks at me, and he says, I hope you are this good. And I was like, I, I, I didn't know what that meant. I was like, yeah, me too. I, I don't I don't know. We turned the corner, Bernard, and, you know, there's a, there's a Lear jet sitting in front of this hangar, all right? So – the first thing that pops in my head, and you will remember this, I remember anything, anybody, you know, my age or older will definitely remember Johnny B. Good, the movie, with Anthony Michael Hall, the very first movie Uma Thurman was in, and when Johnny goes to TCC or whatever the Texas school is, he has that clear jet sitting at the airport yeah. with the horny toad frog. That was the first thing that popped in my head, and I was like, wow, well, I didn't tell Coach Lambert that at the time, but I was like, I know I'm not the number one high school quarterback in the country so this is above and beyond right so we get on the plane and uh you know hopefully there's a statute of limitations on this story but we get on the plane and and uh you know coach reese being coach reese he you know we get on there and he said you know in this real gravelly voice you know carlton your boy shoot and uh, at the time john shoot was a ga um you know, later, obviously, Bob Shoup was a D.C. for, for Coach Franklin there. But John Shoup was a G.A. at the time, um, who's, again, only the second youngest NFL offensive coordinator in the history of the NFL, right, behind Gruden. So um, Shoup had asked me if there's anything I wanted. And I was like, Shoup, I, no, there's nothing I want. I probably should have answered that a different way. But um, Coach Reese goes in, the, goes in the refrigerator on the plane, and he says, your boy, Shoup, you know, hooked you up. And so he pulls out, uh, he pulls out a platter of shrimp, Bernard, and it's kind of, it's got like three tiers to it, right? Boiled shrimp, already peeled. And Coach Reese says, uh, you know, your, your, your boy Shoop wanted to give you a present. So, and this is the worst part of the story, I promise. <clears throat> this three-tiered thing of shrimp, there's a thing of cocktail sauce, right? Sitting at the top, you know. We've all had Vanderbilt meals, you know, and probably Magic is the one who put this thing together anyway, right? So um, there's a thing of cocktail sauce so sitting at the top of this thing, and I, and I looked at I, – I swear this is, is a regretful moment, but I looked at Coach Reese. I looked at Coach, uh, uh, Coach Lambert, and I said, you know, I really don't like cocktail sauce. So you guys have any ketchup? <laughs> And Coach Reese and Lambert, they, you know, as as I would now if some, you know, idiot 17-year-old, 18-year-old kid asked me for, for ketchup after I put cocktail sauce and boiled shrimp on his on his lap. So well, there, um, there, might, there must not be a lot of shrimp in Oklahoma. No, nah, there, there's definitely not. There's definitely let me, not. So, let me tell you, here is a kind of a little connect the dots. My middle brother, Robert, backed up shoot for two years at Swanee quarterback. Yeah. John is, he's, I talked to John last year, um, 
Uh, he's actually bit, uh, really big into the USA rugby. His son plays rugby at Arizona. And so he is really in with USA rugby and had asked me if I had a couple kids actually out here at Southern Oregon that could play rugby. And, um, you know, to, to no one's surprise, there's a large population of Polynesian players here. Um, and they play rugby growing up before they ever played football. So sure, sure. Uh, there was a couple kids that, you know, I gave him, gave two, two shoot to, um, they were going to fly him out to Colorado and go through the USA rugby thing, Bernard. It was, um, you know, so I, you know, again, just the, the type of person that John Shoup was and is, um, he made it really hard for me to say no one, uh, in recruiting. Uh, he just did, you know, everything that you would think of, you know, you know, besides flying on private jets and stuff, uh, John Shoup, uh, literally was sending me a fax, right? There were no text messages back sure. then. I was basically a text message. John Shoup used to send me a, a, a fax message, right? And back then, you remember, Bernard, it was the, the glossy paper, right? It wasn't just a sheet of paper. It was that yeah. special fax glossy paper. So this went on for about three days. And I'm talking about I was getting a message after every class. And back then, I was six classes, so I got a message six times a day. Wow from John Shoup on the fax machine. Well, the fax machine was in the principal's office. So um, about the, at the end of the third day, principal calls me and he says, Carlton, look, you, 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 you're gonna need to call this guy at Vanderbilt and tell him um, he's wasting all my fax paper, right? This stuff is not cheap, you know, it's not. That's right. So I was like, so again, you know, I'm 17 year old kid. I was like, yeah, how am I gonna tell this college coach, hey, you can't do this, you know, my principal. Yeah. So I called John that night and I was like, hey, you know, Coach Shoup, you know, my principal is kind of pissed, right? You're wasting this expensive fax paper. So uh, that next week, I think it was Tuesday, Monday, or it had to have been Tuesday the next week, uh, principal calls me back in. I'm like, look, uh, his name is Mr. Wiseman. Look, Mr. Wiseman, I, I told him to stop, you know, wasting the fax paper. Like I, I told him like what you said. And he looks at me, and says, I want you to sit down. So I sit down, you know, nobody wants to spend time in the principal's office, yeah. let alone in there. So I sit down and he hands me a letter. And so what happened was Shu had sent him a letter and sent him a ream of fax paper and said, hey, this should get us to the end uh, of signing day. And I apologize for wasting your fax paper. That's so it, it was things and, and, and those things are continuous, Bernard, you know, to be able to put something in a kid's head that will make you stand out from another coach, because they're all telling them the same thing. Look, the school is a good school. The football is good football. You're going to win a lot of games. You know, it is finding a way to make yourself stand apart um, besides just, you know, playing in the SEC, going to a top 20 university. Um, you know, Vanderbilt has those things that they can sell and that they should sell. Um, but there still has to be something else. You know, there's got to be a connection that you have with the coach, whether it be the position guy, the recruiting guy, or the head guy, someone has to stand out in that kid's mind in order to get them to, to choose your school ultimately. And that's that's what Coach Shoup did. That's what Gennardo did. That's what, you know, um, Rick George did. Um, and, and Carlton, I bet a lot of the guys who are watching probably are shaking their head in agreement with your assessment. And it was that way for when I was going through there. I wasn't that highly recruited and et cetera. But one thing that's always stuck out during my time, and I've heard it many, many times after that, is your four or five years on that campus is getting you ready for the next 40 or 50 years of your life. And not just the next two or three years, but the rest of your life. And I really, at least for me, and it sounds like it for you, that there was always a big, bigger plan in place, not just the immediate future. And that was one, maybe one of the selling points for you. Is that yes, fair? Absolutely. No, I, I, and this will also make, you know, however many, two or three people watching it. Like, I wanted to be a doctor, uh, Bernard, when I first got to school. Right? I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And obviously, that didn't work out too well after that first semester of ortho grade. So, um, it was, but it was still always understanding what school was going to do for me. You know, there is no way, um, one, a half of 1% chance that if I had gone to OU or if I had gone to Colorado, that I would have been able to get a job in New York City working on Wall Street. That, that probably wouldn't have happened. You know, Vanderbilt allowed me to do that. 
um, working for an advertising firm in New York City. And Vanderbilt did that. You know, Oklahoma and Colorado probably wouldn't have done that. Um, and not picking on Oklahoma, Colorado, or Southern Cal for that matter. If you grow up in those areas, I mean, I know a lot of guys that played at Oklahoma and we came out together and they're doing all right because they played at Oklahoma and they played at a high level and, you know, they were the guy. You know, if you don't leave too far away from home, cool, you're going to be the guy. Um, same thing at Southern Cal, you know, whether Southern Cal is not just a full roster of Southern California kids, but if you stay in Southern California with an SC degree, yeah, you're going to be all right. Um, but again, it's it's the bringing together of kids from all over the country to go to Vanderbilt and be in that bubble. Like you, you live that bubble, I live that bubble. Um, and then to be re-released outside of that bubble, having what Vanderbilt was able to give you, you know, the, the critical thinking and however much hell HOD catches on a daily basis. I mean, you know, to some degree, um, you know, the classes, three or four classes ahead of me to three or four classes behind me, they, we were the guinea pigs for most of what human and organizational development has become. Um, now, they're not giving out any awards and they're not giving out any rings for that, Bernard. Like I tell people, like, we're not going to get a ring for being the best defense in the SEC my senior year. That doesn't happen. You're not going to get a ring um, or any justification of the time you spent doing HOD stuff. But, you know, the, the likes of John Ennis and Kathy Hoover Dempsey and um, uh, Tom uh, Terrence Deal, like these are the people that literally wrote books on how to reframe an organization from the government of Monaco to Southwest Airlines to, you know, local municipal uh, power things. So, you know, being around those folks, which we didn't really, I didn't, I will say this, I didn't fully understand um, what Vanderbilt could do for me after school until I got out of school. And, sure. and that's, and that's having, you know, a dad who, you know, went to college and I was an officer in the military. I mean, it's still, you know, growing up from 17 to 22, you are still, no matter who you are, there's an egocentric centric, centrism that you have that until it happens to you, it doesn't happen. So, well, you know, Carlton, coming out of high school, you're a, you're a big fish in a little pond. You've got a lot of spotlight on you, not just locally and state and regionally, but nationally to an extent. But that fall of 93, you're going into Vanderbilt for that first camp. I want to put you in that mindset. You're meeting your teammates in person for the first time. You're in the camp a few days before the vets get there. Talk to us about that mindset of those first few days. And what was it, what, at what point, because I know you got redshirted your freshman year, at what point, either your freshman year or beyond, did it click in your head that you had that confidence knowing not only am I good enough to be on this team, but man, I'm going to end up being a starter. Um, that first camp, you know, we were actually, we were in camp as freshmen for five days before the veterans showed up. We were in camp so long, Bernard, as freshmen that from uh, Branscombe, what's, no, what's the dorm right there next to Memorial? Yeah, that's Branscombe. The Branscombe, so. From Branscombe to McGugan, there was that grass. Now there's a building sitting on there. We wore a path to that grass that stayed until we graduated from college. <laughs> By going back and forth, what amounts to probably four times a day or more, yeah. we yeah. wore a path in that grass. So um, it, was, it was definitely harder than you probably can prepare yourself for physically. Um, until you just get around the, the actual speed of these cats. I mean, I was I was 17 when I got to college. You know, I'm I'm looking at a cat, you know, Rico Francis, who's probably, you know, he looked like he was 28, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Rico, first time I saw Rico, he had, you know, I walk in the weight room, he's got his shirt off, and I'm like, yeah, I'm bigger than him. I'm taller than him, but I ain't bigger than this cat. Like, this dude is put together, Gerald Collins. You know, you walk in, you see Gerald Collins, and, he doesn't say a word to you for like three years and finally get Gerald to say something to you. You know, these, Ger these were just was a freshman. different. Gerald was a freshman my senior year. He hit okay. as hard as anybody I'd ever been around, high school like, or like, college. The, the, so the speed and the, the physicality of it, you know, he had to get used to. But 
you know, the, also the other part of that, those five days were spent on Vanderbilt's campus, right? Going from Branscombe to Gillette or uh, Branscombe to um, McGugan and back. You know, that's the way your world consisted around. And then the veterans get there and then they start talking about bell buckle. And, you know, I've, I've listened to a couple of people talk about bell buckle on your deal so far. So I won't literally beat that, that dead horse. But <laughs> when you get on that bus and you're headed out there in the middle of the night, you have no idea where the hell you're going. And, you know, then the seniors and the guys that are freshmen start telling you, you know, all this other stuff, which they didn't tell you on your recruiting visit about That's being right. out there with three legged dogs and, you know, a pack of dogs coming and, and salt Peter in your food. And it just, oh, there's no end to the amount. I heard Luke say, you know, there were two stalls for, you know, 80 kids. And yeah. That there was ankle deep water in the shower. I mean, it was a miserable, miserable existence for <laughs> those, those first two weeks, you know. And and again, camp back then, you know, you had 20, 29 days and um, you were going to practice two a days, you know. Um, I saw something recently where Alabama fans were something about a helicopter coming down and, and drying the field at Alabama. Oh, yeah, I saw it. Absolutely. I was like, look, that's a game field. Donardo did that for two practice fields in Bell Buckle, Tennessee at the Webb School, you know, in 1993. Like, I saw that. Like, that's when when, when stuff starts to get real and the first day in pads you have to run a 21 110s. Like, and, and again, Shelton Quarles and yeah. Rico Francis are, you know, just on number 19, just killing it still. And you're sitting there like, all right, I'm not going to breathe anymore. I'm going to die. I'm never going to actually make it to play college football, you know. Um, but I, I, those practices were so hard, Bernard. You know, they were, you know, Donardo was, you know, he was a he was a dictator. Um, he was going to have it done his way. And I, and I understand why he was being that way. I mean, he was literally trying to change a culture of a place that had not won very many football games. And... You know, he was as as hard um, a disciplinarian as I had ever seen, including my dad, you know, being a colonel in the Air Force. Um, but once you got into pads and you got on the field and you kind of had some inkling of what you were doing, um, there was some time in that first camp where um, probably somewhere right after Derek Wilhelm hit me with a crack back block and flipped me in the air three times. Um, somewhere right after that period, um, and you tackle a kid who is really fast, you tackle a kid, you know, like Royce Love, who was in the class ahead of me, who was the biggest fullback I'd ever seen in, in my life. Um, you tackle a kid like that, or you have success, again, and, and it starts to, to, to hit you that, yeah, hey, you know, I thought I could play college football, and more specifically, I thought I could play SEC football, but, you know, this is, I'm, I, I can do this. This is it's not that hard, you know, uh, linebacker is to me the best job that you can have. You just run around and hit people, you know, like the kid from this year's combine, you know, I literally, I, they're going to pay me to do stuff to people that they would put me in jail for. And that's right. I mean, that's not very far off base when you play defense. So there were, there were the, in that somewhere near the end of that camp where you kind of finally figure out, you know, physically that you can do it and, and play with these guys who are older than you, who have been through some wars, who regardless of the record, you know, when you're an offensive lineman and you've lined up in the SEC for three or four years, you're a grown man at that point in time. If you if you've played in football games in that conference, you you know, you, you tend to grow up a lot faster. So it was somewhere in there, Bernard, but it wasn't probably until you know, probably my, my, my red shirt sophomore year. So my third year in school where it was really like, okay, um, you know, Dow Howard got in there, that staff was there. Um, uh, it was, it was around somewhere in there where it was really like, okay, this is easy. Um, but we weren't very good because, um, they literally tried to throw the whole Pittsburgh Steeler playbook at us. And as coach Parker put it after that first fall and that second, that first spring, the second spring we had with them, I'm, I'm sitting in there, I'm sitting next to Anthony Jordan and, and Jamie Duncan and Coach Parker looks at us and he says, well, we screwed up. We thought you guys would be smarter than our Michigan State guys and apparently that's not true. So we're going to dumb down this whole playbook. And he kind of said it, and Coach Parker could be slick sometimes. You know, He kind of said it was like, yeah, you guys are supposed to be Vanderbilt, supposed to be smarter, supposed to be able to handle these things. 
and he was comparing us to his Michigan State guys in the classroom. And, you know, no offense to Michigan State, but that didn't go over too well in the room. So um, they did, they, you know, they, to, to some degree, dumbed it down, Bernard, and, and we got really, really good. And, you know, like anyone will tell you, and however it comes to them, whether it comes to them as a freshman, whether you're a tailback or receiver or corner who could, you know, really – go in the college and play right away because those three positions to me are different, you know, tailback, just do what you've been doing for life, find a way to go and run real fast corner, cover the guy in front of you. If you're in a man scheme defense um, receiver, Hey, just beat the guy in front of you and go catch the ball. Um, every single other position to me, offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, safety, quarterback. Um, there's two to three to 5,000 more steps you have to take as a college athlete. It's, and football player to really figure out what the heck you're doing. So um, that that fourth year in school was when it was like, all right, this is easy. You know, I understand what it's like to go look at film, you know, and that and, and I tell my kids that all the time, like, are you looking at film or are you studying film? You know, can you answer these questions for me after you've watched the film? It's not like, oh, well, he broke away on one really long run. Well, what run, what kind of run was it? Was it zone? Was it gap scheme? You know, was it ISO? Was it power? Was it just outside zone? Like teaching us how to do those things we didn't get until the end of being in college. And now these kids, you know, as juniors and sophomores in high school, Bernard, they are they are prepared at least to tell you what they're looking at. Um, they might not always know why they're looking at it, but at least they are being told what to look at and how to study film. And, and that's the way this game has evolved now. That, that's, you know, they're a, a thinking part to it yeah. now. Well, they, they've got all the technology that we didn't, of course, ha and have any of that, plus all of the gaming uh, systems that they have. Uh, you may, outside of the sport, they may laugh, well, how does that translate? Well, it gets you thinking about yeah. things. But I want to take you to, you got redshirted your freshman year. What point during the school term or that season did you learn you were going to be redshirted? Um, I think it was probably about, it probably was right after coming out of camp, out of, out of Bell Buckle, and I had a horrible camp, Bernard. I, Bernard, Bell Buckle was like kryptonite. I, I couldn't stand that place. I mean, I was one tell, immature when I first. Tell me anybody who did enjoy it. One, one I was, I, well, the kickers enjoyed it. The kickers and punters had a grand <laughs> time in Bell Buckle, Tennessee. Um, but it, it was probably right coming out of there. It was the one time um, in my entire five-year career at Vanderbilt where I didn't travel um, and I'll never forget they went and watched um, a movie you know you go watch a movie on Friday night right and I you know I didn't know that that wasn't part of anything that you know I had experienced or whatever so I didn't go to the hotel I dressed but I didn't go to the hotel and they went and watched The Fugitive right the movie with Tommy Lee um, in it and uh, Harrison Ford and so uh, or not Harrison Ford uh, Wesley Snipes so for like 30 years, I boycotted that movie, Bernard, because I wasn't on that travel roster to go watch that movie. I never, I didn't watch Fugitive for like 30 years. Oh, wow. Uh, but that was, that was the first time um, where it was made apparently abundantly clear um, that I wasn't. Because the first game, my, fresh, my true freshman year was at Wake Forest, and I traveled to that game. Um, but then the second game was Alabama at home when uh, this guy wearing number two completely shredded our entire defense um, to the two the dude I think, shredded I a lot think, of defenses. I think he I think he had I think he had some like two hundred yards receiving that day, Bernard. It was he he's he is not and I and I saw somebody trying to give him credit probably a couple months back, but he that's an un that's an unrecognizable talent, that kid. What's what was his name? Um oh gosh, you just caught me. I'm gonna look him up again, but he's from oh, Jackson Olin High School here in town. Yeah, was that was just, the other thing, him being a Tennessee kid. Oh, what's that kid's name? Uh, he, I'll tell you who he was. He was uh, Reggie Bush before Reggie Bush. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Dave, David Palmer. David Palmer. Yeah. David Palmer, I saw him. And, we, you know, Alabama and Vanderbilt always have these knockdown, drag out battles for whatever reason. Um, but that day, we had Alabama third and 24 on like the minus 20 or minus 18 or something like that. And David Palmer went up in between three people on our sideline at 25 yards and came down with one foot in the ground. And then 
the rest of that drive, he went down. I mean, playing Wildcat quarterback as it's known now, I mean, literally back in 92 or 93, like David Palmer was in that position for Alabama. He was taking snaps from the quarterback, you know. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> seeing that and understanding, well, hey, if I can practice against these guys that, you know, are going out on the field and playing on Saturdays, then then I can do it. So it, it didn't take very long. And, again, you, you got to be – and there's some arrogance, there's some cockiness, Bernard, you know this, that to, to be able to play uh, football that you're just, you know, if you don't, if you're not just born with it, then you know, or have it innately, you, you know, the football, the game's going to teach you, um, you know, Lawrence Taylor in any given Sunday, right, when he's in the, 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 the sweat room with, with Jamie Foxx and he says, yeah, the game taught you how to talk junk, like, yeah, it does, you know, it teaches you how um, to sort of survive to some degree, but um being a bell buckle man it bernard that was horrible man and we and we went three years and it was bad all three years but it it does teach you you know that that things aren't necessarily that bad you know college teaches you that in general but when you play football in college and you know i i sound like or we sound like you know our dads well you know you didn't have it as hard as we did <laughs> that's like right that. you know we, we we i think last year bernard i think we had we had two and one got canceled because of the smoke. We had two two-a-day practices. That was it. That we actually wow. put on pads both 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 sessions of practice. And I want to say the second one was like just shoulder pads and helmets. I don't even think we had. Right. Like, right. And I get it. You know, there's a safety issue in college football, and 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 it should be. It should have been there a long time ago. You know, I was just uh, I was just in Nashville uh, a couple of weeks ago with. Um, you know, some guys I came in with, Kirk Williams, Eric Vance, uh, Marcus Williams, or M.E. Williams, uh, Jason Hill. And we were talking about it, you know, that, yeah, football is starting to take away some things. You know, when you get up in the morning and your shoulder doesn't work right, or your hip doesn't work right. But worse <laughs> off, when you walk in a room and yeah. you just don't know why you're in that room, like, yeah, there's, there's, there's some issues with that. But I wouldn't. I'm sure if you talk to or asked anybody listening to us right now or, or any college football player, I'm not sure, um, you know, withstanding severe injuries, I'm not sure any of those guys would ever give that back. Oh, you no, know, I bet you. Too much time, too 99, much time. 99% of the guys would say the the same thing. And, and Carlton, we're, we're getting close toward the, the end of our, our talk. Yeah. I could talk with you for hours, and I want to – Gosh, there's so many people. Some of my teammates, some of your teammates are in there. Rod Keith, Brian Donnelly, yeah. uh, Alfonso is still with us. John Staley, uh, Nizam Walter is there. Thank you, guys. And, and again, if I mispronounce some names, I apologize. But by the time you, it was your senior year, did you realize going into that senior year what kind of defense you guys were going to be able to put on the field in 97? Um, I, I knew, I knew that we were going to be good on defense. Um, you know, we, there was a lot of times where we'd be sitting in a room um, on a Thursday night and just be like, all right, well, if we can hold them to a field goal and we get a pick six and we get a safety, then, you know, maybe we can win this game five to three. <laughs> so we knew that we were going to have to stop people. I, I, I think we did know we were going to be pretty good. I mean, there's, um, you know, Jamie Duncan had already been, all SEC. He was going to be all American. We knew that, you know, Anthony Jordan, who to this day, the best athlete maybe I've ever been around in my life, you know, uh, Corey Chavis, another great athlete, just on top of, you know, his football knowledge and skill. Um, you know, Fred Vincent, Corey's cousin for crying out loud as the other corner. Um, there were, there were just so many pieces that, one, we knew what we were doing defensively. You know, they had literally given and kind of taken the handcuffs back off of us as far as what we could do. Um, you know, and I could call it Iowa football game to this day because it's still pretty much the same thing. I mean, we ran under 8-3 Trey 95% of the time, Bernard. So <laughs> we, we finally knew and were, were, were able to do all these things. And, you know, those guys just trusted us. We were able to make hands checks and things like that where you go back and watch those two years, my last two years of us playing Tennessee, you know, I tell kids this all the time. Peyton Manning's a great player, and he's not the best player I ever played against in the SEC, but he's a great, great football player. Peyton Manning threw one touchdown pass against Vanderbilt's defense in the last three years he was in college, and that was in our senior year at Neyland Stadium 
and we're double covering the slot and i'll never forget sorry ainsley ainsley battles falls down and jermaine copeland hits a skinny slant from the slot and scores a touchdown that was a one touchdown pass Peyton threw in three years against us you know we we were able to go and they allowed us to match wits with wits now did we think we were going to be the best defense in the conference or number four or five in the country i, I don't know if we we thought we would be that good um but there was also that part where we knew we were going to have to be that good just because we knew that our offense wasn't going to be that good, Bernard. And that's that's always in that thing. You know, Vanderbilt has a great offense, so they got a great defense. You know, let's find a way to put those two things together. Um, yeah. and, and, and you and I, world, you know, you and I both know that that can be done. Um, it just takes a special person to get that whole show rolling in the right direction. So. Yeah, I think your senior year, maybe Zolman was a freshman and Damian Allen were this, was the senior quarterback. Yeah, Damian, Damian, Damian was our quarterback. Um, yeah. Craig Zolman was a freshman yeah. on that team. You know, there were – Yoder was a receiver as a Todd, sophomore. Todd, Todd Yoder lived with us uh, the, before he ever had a credit to his name. Good old Todd Yoder. Well, let me, let, me, uh, let me give you some rapid fire as we get finished okay. here. What comes to mind, about to okay? Lose, about to lose my sunlight, I guess. Yeah, well, it looks like a gorgeous day out, out west. Oh, there's not a cloud in the sky here, Bernard. There's, there's really actually not a cloud in the sky. Now That's it's about fantastic. about 50 degrees out here, but it feels good. It feels good. All right. All right, give me your best game play or memory from your years at Vanderbilt. My best play. Who'd you light up or what game stands out the best? You got that. The, 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 the play didn't have anything to do with me. I mean, anybody who was on the field the day Bill Marin Angel took off on his own and, and faked that punt at Alabama, uh, I was the left tackle on that play. So, um, and again, this is how small football gets, Bernard. The returner in that game for Alabama was a guy named Marcel West. Marcel West and I had grown up in Florida together on Eglin Air Force Base, and I used to chase his home run records for YMCA baseball, right? So awesome. I was going to I was gonna try to kill Marcel, right? I'm going to try to kill this dude. I've been chasing him my whole life. I'm going to kill him. And he starts running towards us without the ball. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. Um, so that, that is literally would be the most memorable, um, play, most memorable play myself, uh, LSU, my senior year, I was sick as a dog going in a game. I had some like 103 temperature or something crazy. Um, the doctors gave me a whole bunch of stuff. I went and played in the game and at one point in the game, you know, cause Donardo had left Vanderbilt, he goes to LSU at one point in the game, you know, they're. 12 personnel, two tight ends on line of scrimmage, and Herb Tyler was their quarterback. And then they had three tailbacks, Cecil Collins, Rondell Mealy, Kevin Falk being the best of all those guys. And we'd already broke Cecil Collins' leg. Jamie and AJ did that. I didn't. And uh, Herb Tyler, he, he's, he's calling an audible, Bernard, right? He goes under center, and he stands up, and he calls an audible. And I, and I, I, I will never forget this because – Cedric and Ronnie Gordon and Kenny Simon used to, I mean, this is bred into my thinking. If they, you know, aces down, that was a snap count to get people ready. And if they changed the play, it was deuces or something like that. It was going to be on two. And so Herb Tyler stands up from under the center. He says deuces, blah, 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 blah. And Jamie Duncan and I turned and looked at each other and just had this ESP moment of, did he just really just say the exact same cadence from the three years that we lived with Donardo and they didn't change a damn word? Like, And so we pointed <laughs> Herb and we're like, hey, they're gonna run the ball right here. And Herb goes back under center, stands up, calls a timeout and starts walking towards his sideline. Like, hey, they know what the play is. We're not running that shit. Like, they, they know exactly where the play's going. And Donardo's looking on the field like, I can't believe that these two guys really remember what was going on. Like it was like it, uh, me and Jamie thought somebody was playing a bad joke on us. It was. Well, it was you know, Carlton. Easy. You know what that is? That's the game within the game that the fans yeah. and the stands don't know yeah. about and don't see. Absolutely. And that's yeah. that really is only from your perspective. You and Jamie standing right there. You're ten feet or five feet from the quarterback. Yeah. And those are the those are the to me the game within the game are the best stories. You can talk about touchdowns and big catches all the time, 
But I love that kind of stuff. All right, let me give you another one. Favorite class right. at Vanderbilt? Favorite class. Um, I got two, two classes. Physics, mm -hmm. uh, because I got a B plus in it. Uh, and it was an arts and science class, and right, I had no business not being on Peabody campus, right? So I got a B plus in physics. Mm -hmm. um, and then my other one was I did an independent study, which I know is not a real answer, but I did an independent study with Terrence Deal, who, again, the guy who writes the books for Reframing Organizations. That's right. That's and right. um, I was doing an independent study with him one summer, and the CEO, who's now passed away, of Southwest Airlines came in and they're sitting there telling a story you know anyone who had professor deal knows he didn't have a desk in his office and all those types of things bernard that's a story i'll tell you later like those listening to those two people talk i mean that was a semester worth of knowledge that that those guys were were just saying just sitting there and on a couch listening to these two guys talk carlton the fact that you remember all these things speaks volumes for the experience and we're almost done one more question but i want to welcome jim arnold beth graves dodd ed Parrish, tim richards and Brandy Jackson, Scott, thank you guys for stopping in. I'm wrapping up with Carlton Hall. Hey, a, spe a special shout out, if I can, Bernard, to Mr. Yeah. Arnold. You know, I've never met him. And obviously he is, you know, above and beyond an All-American guy at Vanderbilt. I've never met, well, you tell him I said hello. I've never, I, I don't, I, I don't remember ever meeting. Sure. Him. Well, Jim, if you're still on, I, I definitely want to get you on the show sometime in the upcoming weeks. And, and he's been very active on our, our group here. And I really appreciate all of that. Uh, if you've got, if you've got a kid who you're recruiting, doesn't matter what school you're at, and they ask you, what is it about Vanderbilt? Why should I, as a student athlete, why do I want to go to Vanderbilt or consider it? What are you telling that that junior or senior in high school about our school that may convince them that this is the place for them? Um, you know, to me. And I would think, Bernard, honestly, that this would be an easy answer for any of us who went to Vanderbilt. Um, and I actually had this discussion with Coach Mason a couple weeks ago. Um, if a kid is considering Vanderbilt to me, it is, um, it's really an easy decision um, in hindsight. Um, I've heard Coach Franklin say this. I've heard Mason say this. I've heard Woody say this. The hardest part about getting a kid to commit to Vanderbilt University is for that kid to have to go tell his boys he's going to Vanderbilt University. Because <clears throat> the ones that Vanderbilt really wants and needs to play football and to be a good student athlete and to give back to that community in the bubble and outside of the bubble. <clears throat> for that kid to have to go tell his boys he's not going to Southern Cal or Oklahoma or Colorado or Miami or Arizona or, or fill in the blank of all those kids you know that were in a class ahead of me or that were in my class those kids made the tough decision to tell their boys i'm going to vanderbilt and this is why and the reason why to me is yes you know they have it right the degree in the city and the sec or, or the, the tagline that's out there right now <clears throat> i appreciate that because here's the other thing in nashville now bernard you and i both know is completely changed from when you were in school and when i was in school mm -hmm. you can go and get a job and not be in the music <clears throat> music business at all and get a job working for a fortune 100 company let alone fortune 500 company now in nashville you couldn't do that always so do you want to spend four or five years in the city of nashville or do you want to spend them in starkville mississippi or gainesville florida or knoxville tennessee or tuscaloosa alabama now to support kid to say well i'm not going to alabama i'm going to go to vanderbilt the, the thing is two three four years down the road if you're good enough to go be, play to play football you can go to the NFL, you're going to go to the NFL. They're going to find you. There's an army of intelligence officers in the NFL that wear that shield that are going to find you. <clears throat> but it becomes the five, six, ten years, if you're lucky, after football's over, that Vanderbilt really is able to do things for kids that they don't really know about. You know, um, it's the Southern, Southeastern Conference football. Now, to me, Vanderbilt has the ability to, you know, win games like Northwestern in the Big Ten and win games like Stanford in the Pac-12. And I, I don't agree with the argument, well, it's the SEC, it's just harder. That's, to me, <clears throat> private conversation, bullshit. 
you can win games at Vanderbilt University with the kids you need from all over the country to come in there and do that because <clears throat> it is a it is a city. It is a capital city. You can get a job after. You can get a job during. You know, now your mind is focused on football. <clears throat> but there are enough things that are good about Vanderbilt. Um, now, there's a lot of bad things, too. You and I know we, we talked about that, you know, kind of pre-show. But there are so many good things that go on at Vanderbilt when you are a student athlete. And it could be better. Um, that. It, 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 it should make those other schools pale in comparison, Bernard. And, and again, I know it's hard. I mean, you can't wave a little magic wand and, and, and have a kid come to the school. But there are so many positive things um, at Vanderbilt University for a 17, 18, 19-year-old kid to be looking at um, that it should not matter that they're getting recruited by Auburn or Tennessee or, you know, Florida or Mississippi or, you know, Texas a and Texas for that matter. So um, it, it, it takes someone, again, to stand out, you know, that's a coach, you know, from the head coach to recruiting coach to, to whatever the position is. Um, but to get a kid interested and excited and, you know, obviously winning cures a lot of those those ills as well. So I think it can be done. I think um, – you know, there's 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 help needed in getting some of those things done, no doubt. Um, but I, I do think that it is a special, special place um, that can pay back dividends tenfold over, you know, over the course of someone's lifetime, which, again, you know, as I've said it, as my buddies have said it, um, as I'm sure you and your buddies have said it, like Vanderbilt has allowed you to do things that had you gone to your local regional power five university man, you wouldn't have been able to do that's right that's right well carlton i i couldn't have said it any better and i sure sure appreciate you being candid and, and being passionate and just sharing with us some of your your memories and it was so great to, to meet you finally in person and to take it take this trip for this last hour uh, i really appreciate you sharing this with us tonight no absolutely but like i said to to, to be able to do this and um, to watch these shows and reminisce with some of these guys. And again, like hear stories from, you know, guys that we, you went to school with, um, you know, guys that even went to school back in the 60s. Um, because my last my last shout out here, Bernard, beside yeah. you, needs, needs to go to um, <clears throat> a young man from Oklahoma City who was really probably the catalyst without me know, knowing to go to Vanderbilt. It was a guy named Steve Coleman. Steve Coleman went to Vanderbilt back in the 60s, uh, late 60s, Steve, if you ever see this. Um, Steve was actually roommates with a guy named Christy. Um, as you are familiar with Christy Cookies down south, right? Sure. Um, Steve Coleman went to school with Christy's Cookies, right? Like he was a lawyer. He is a lawyer in Oklahoma City, Bernard, and he was the one kind of catalyst behind the scenes and <laughs> did everything above board that said, Hey, Vanderbilt, you should look at this guy. He's fairly smart. He, he can tackle people pretty well. Um, and I didn't understand that and, and fully grasp that idea until, you know, somewhere in my senior year after I committed Bernard, but even after that. So Steve Coleman definitely deserves a, uh, a shout out for, for helping in this process to, to getting me to be part of this community and, and part of this brotherhood that ultimately – Nobody else in the country can understand sometimes. That's so, right. Uh, they, they don't always make it hard. They don't always make it easy. But, um, you know, from the bell buckles to the McGugans to the, you know, listening to the crazy stories and on, on West End, um, it is it is definitely a brotherhood. It is something that, like I said, I appreciate you being able to get these guys together through uh, social media somehow since we we got to do our part to social distance at this point. So I appreciate it, Bernard, and thank you very, very much for having me on there. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely, Carlton, and you represent us well, and, and we, you make us proud, and I know we make all of us make you proud. But I want to thank everybody for spending another time with us this week on Conversations with Commodores, one of the very best LSEC linebacker, now the new, new D.C. and linebackers coach at Milliken in, in Illinois, and Carlton, Hope you have a blessed evening and stay safe, stay healthy, everybody, do the right thing, and we'll try to come back to you again next week with another conversation. Hope you guys have a good evening. Thanks, Thank Bernard. You All right, I think 
Carlton, we're we're off of that. So thank you very much. No, thank you.